welcome YouTube. Uh, we'll just let the notifications get out there and get people um, a minute or two to come in uh, before I hit the uh, hit the timer and get into it. Oh, I have to set the uh, the banner too so that we know. Uh, uh, no, we don't want to do that. We actually want to edit it. Hello, hello, who have we got there? Facebook, I'm I'm going to take a guess and say that might be Naomi. I'm just doing the banner and we'll just be about to get going. Um, uh, okay, so that, that looks like it's safe. Let's... I can put it on there, that's good. Um, <clears throat> take this one down. Uh, when the next person comes in, I'll run the uh, I'll run the video and we will get going. Um, G'day bird nerds and nature nuts. Um, I'm down I'm down here. Look. That's me. Summer series replay today. And um, this is a conversation that's quite important for consumers who visit big hardware stores and plant nurseries and may have a rodent problem. And they go and buy whatever whatever it's called, whatever your product is called. But there are some that are safe to use and some that are, um, well, actually, let's say there are some that are safer to use than others for birds and other wildlife that might ingest um, those poisons, non-target species. So the conversation today is between Dr. Holly Parsons as part of the regular Monday with Holly kind of fortnightly Monday show that Holly and I do talking about urban birds. The focus of this one is really was really on uh, urban birds that were being... Um, uh, oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for that. Uh, block you. Um, fantastic. Um, sorry, just had some spam in the comments. Yes, so the... Um, we focus on urban birds and there's been a project that BirdLife has been running for um, uh, for a long time, raising awareness with 
the big hardware and nursery retailers, supermarkets, about the pesticides that they sell. Um, Holly's the manager of the Urban Birds Program at BirdLife Australia. And we spoke with Maggie Watson, Dr. Maggie Watson. She was in the conversation. She's a lecturer at Charles Sturt University. And um, the Charles, uh, Maggie has skills in toxicology. So that's why the team was as selected. I'm going to pull myself out of here. Um, have a listen to the sound right as we get going. So I hope it comes through. And hopefully, Naomi, we're less... Um, I certainly don't look like I'm frozen, so I I reset everything, all the router, modem, blah, 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 everything. I think we're all right this time, so fingers crossed. Here we go. Oh, here we go. It's the bird emergency, and we've got some cockies in the background. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. On my, oh, I don't know, over there, is Dr. Maggie Watson, who is an ornithologist at Charles Sturt University, um, a bird nerd and a bit of an expert on the, the content today. And down there, I feel like I'm on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> um, Dr. Holly Parsons, the manager of the Urban Birds Program, better, better known as Birds in Backyard. Hello, Holly from BirdLife Australia. But we're, uh, are we retiring the birds in backyards? Is that what's happening? No, 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 birds in backyards are still in existence. So it's kind of the the program within Urban Birds that's all about um, how people can create bird-friendly gardens and take part in garden bird surveys. So it still yeah. exists. It is still up and running well and truly. We've just blossomed out to encompass some other programs as well. Well, that's what we like to see, BirdLife Australia growing its reach. Growing its reach. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to be friendly to birds. We've done our, we've done our gardens one. We've done, we've done our sort of plant selection and we've done our hollows. Today it's about how can you, how can you do the right thing if you do have to get rid of some pests in your domestic situation and further agricultural or horticultural, your factory, whatever. Um, and of course, there was quite a bit of conversation about rodenticides and what, um, what was planned. So perhaps who wants to introduce that situation about the broad scale control of rodents in our current mice plague. You want to do that one, Maggie? Sure, uh, no problem. Uh, so um, the house mice mouse uh, came to Australia probably in the late 1700s, um, but the first documented plague um, was in uh, the early 1900s. Um, probably there were plagues before, but people just really didn't bother to, um, to do too much documentation on it. Um, plagues are a way of life for a lot of Australian animals. Um, uh, different types of, of rodents plague, different types of insects plague. It's just their response to the boom and blast cycle that happens here in Australia because of, of, of rainfall. So the mice aren't doing actually anything bad in that sense. But when, uh, when you have a mouse plague um, that exceeds the, uh, the comfort of, of, of humans, especially farmers, then you start losing a lot of crop and um, livestock and uh, all the furnishings in your house. And they run across your face at night. And yeah, it's, it becomes pretty disgusting pretty fast. And so we have um, a series of of lethal controls uh, for them. Uh, the ones that were developed before 1970 um, are called first generation. And the ones that were developed after 1970 are called second generation. Uh, the first generation poisons work exactly the same as the second generation poisons, except the second generation poisons tend to be much more 
long lasting. They're no more lethal than in, um, than each other, but they're uh, longer lasting. So uh, first generation poisons um, are things like warfarin. If, you, if you've got heart trouble, you might um, take a little bit of warfarin to thin your blood out. Uh, and um, uh, Kumatril, um, these are anticoagulants that make you bleed to death uh, at the right dosage. Uh, and um, they generally take about three days to to work, uh, three to seven, depending on how much you eat. Okay. Uh, second I, generation can poisons. Just, can yeah. I just stop you there, Maggie, because I, I know of a couple of brand names and can you identify mm. for us which ones there are? Now, in the supermarket, you see Ratsack and you see Talon. Are they the same active ingredients and is one better than the other in... Uh, in a okay. Rat, rat sack isn't rat sack. <laughs> There's several different types of rat sack. So rat sack uh, double strength is the good guy. <laughs> That's got um, warfarin. So you look for the word warfarin. That's the one you want. Normal rat sack has um, various chemicals like uh, bromodialone or um, bromofacin. Uh, those are the bad guys. Those are the ones that stick around for um, hundreds of days in 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 the animal uh, or the dead animal. Um, the other one, the brand name is the you can't get it at the supermarkets, but you can get it at like um, land agents and stuff. It's called Racumen. 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 That's that's the other really good one. So those are first generation ones. They're very effective, but they break down almost immediately. So those, those are the ones that we uh, encourage um, domestic people to use and farmers where they can because they break down um, usually within 24 hours of being ingested. And so the secondary poisoning is much less. So can I just get, get it clear? They're the oldest of the chemical compounds. So they're the yeah. old ones. So what? What are the reasons that um, people are pushing the second generation ones? There's a mistaken belief that they work faster. So there was a lot of misinformation that came from the New South Wales um, agriculture minister who said it works within 24 hours. It works within an hour. Neither of those are correct. It takes three to seven days for the um that chemical to work. The reason why they were developed is because they stick around a lot longer. Okay. And let, I think most of us are, are, are pretty aware of how to do baiting in the home, but the, the thing, I've, my housemate has got one of these humane, non-lethal traps. But he catches the mice in his shed. Mm -hmm. But he either lets them go, or he has to kill them. How do you? Yeah. How do you humanely kill uh, mice that you have caught in in a way which is non-lethal? I mean, to me, it it, it seems <laughs> it, it, it it seems like Hobson's choice, isn't it? Well, um, I used to work in a pet store way, 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 way back. And um, we had to feed mice to um, our snakes. And uh, as part of the RSPCA oversight of this, um, we were taught by RSPCA, um, not RSPCA, ASPCA, <laughs> sorry, it was in the US, <laughs> um, members, that the best way to kill a mouse or a rat to stun them is you pick them up by the tail and you whap them down whack on something on, really. Whack them on your desk, okay. Whack so them on your desk. Just like um, Sylvester used to do to Sweetie, Sweetie Pie and... Yep, and boom, 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 boom. <laughs> okay. Um, and and uh, no, it's not nice, but it's quicker, faster, and less dangerous than trying to put them in like a tent with CO2 or... Uh, uh, the other more considered humane methods. Um, I think there's a CO2 cartridge um, trap somewhere. 
Okay, so so that would be that they go into a chamber of some sort and then you um, you gas them. Yeah, the, um, it's you can buy them. I think they're prohibitively expensive though. <laughs> Um, but the, but I guess the whole point, and, and this is what, what Holly needs to talk to you about, is um, no matter what lethal thing you choose to use, um, you need to make sure that you're not creating a bigger problem by having a mouse that's full of poison for 250 days um, that's just sitting there waiting for your pet dog to eat it or the bird um, that um, is scavenging. Um, and that, that's, that's the whole point, is, is, is finding that happy medium of how to kill mice and how not to kill everything else around it. Okay, so let, before we move on with, with Holly, because that's how do, we stop, how do we stop the ingestion of the dead animals is going to be a, a, a big thing. But let's, let's just get the brands clear. If it's a broad-scale yes. agricultural purpose, racumen is what you... Uh, oh, agri oh, so agriculture, we're, we're different. <laughs> okay, so, so are, they, are in, they different it, chemicals or just different brand names? Um, I actually don't know what racumen is in the agricultural um, space. I think it's the same. Um, elders um, told me that it was the same name, but I haven't checked. I was just explaining, Naomi. It's not frozen. I hadn't unmuted my my mic. I I stopped it. I was just explaining the the problem, the conundrum with brands. Um, Maggie's just about to go on and and explain what are in the Broadacre products that are marketed through the stock and station agents and um, directly to agricultural enterprises in magazines and and um on on those websites but they they often use the same brand names that people are familiar with like i just mentioned you know maybe over 30 or 40 years as ratsack or talon racumen and they'll market them into the broad scale but they're a different active ingredient so they'll call it new improved or um, double strength or whatever they'll just hang a hang a title on it for that market but they're often very different actual active ingredients. So that's that's the only point I wanted to make is that you need to, I mean, in the Australian context, if you're looking for domestic things, we need to know that uh, you've got to look for the ones that have got warfarin in, in them. And Maggie will talk about the Broadacre things now. That up recently to make sure it is the same name. Do you know, Holly? Is it is recommended? Um I believe it's the that. same name, but it'll be the same active ingredient. It's the same active ingredient, yeah. which is the Kutamatrol. Kutamatrol, yeah. yeah. Um, so that is available for household and shed use as a little like square packet, and you yep. just toss it around um, in areas where your domestic dogs can't get to it because they still will eat it, and it's still poisonous, um, mm -hmm. but it's... Um, when your mouse eats it or your rat eats it, it goes into their um, into their digestive system and breaks down almost immediately. Yeah, now, racumen is also available as a paste. So. No, that's yeah. It comes in these little packets. They're they're yeah. they're pasty things in like a. Um, so that can't they do have an agricultural version of it um, that is used for broad scale um, spreading. Um, but the other broad scale one that's used in agriculture that you can't use in the house is zinc phosphide, which is neither a first or second generation pesticide. It's just a stuff. It's just stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just having a look now at um, 
an old elders rural post from 2017 and seeing what it will bring up for control in rice fields. So what have they, what are they suggesting? Um, Rodalon, which is a late, uh, late generation uh, <coughs> coagulant. Uh, the active ingredient in Rodalon is uh, diphenthiolone. So that's a second gen. That's a second gen, so yeah. no. Yeah. Bad. Okay. So, so basically, you're looking for your first generation rodenticide. So the two ingredients you're looking for are warfarin or coumatrol. Cum I can never pronounce that one. Um, Me neither. They're, it's horrible. They're, they're the ones that if you have to bait they're the ones to go for. And as Maggie said, in um, agricultural settings, there is also zinc phosphide, which is a rodenticide, but it's not an anticoagulant rodenticide. So it doesn't cause the rodents to bleed to death. Um, it basically forms a phosphine gas in their stomach. Um, and it's very, it needs to be done in open settings. It's got a whole um, series of risks around them for people as well, you know, mm. that if those gases open up and you inhale them, you're in big trouble as well. So it, it's a it needs to be done in very strict settings in a broad scale agricultural use. It's definitely not anything for a shed, a confined space around the home at all. Yeah. It's um yeah. it tastes very sweet. Uh, so sheep get into it and you can lose a whole flock. And is it something that is going to be um, bad news for the scavengers and and our birds of prey. I think, yeah, like Maggie said, it's, it's a bit hit and miss. I think we're particularly through the mouse plague in Western New South Wales, where there have been problems with zinc phosphide this time around, is where actually grain eating species have got into grain that has been laced with zinc phosphide. Um, and so we, that's where we've seen, you know, reports of um, mascular deaths and corellas and things as well. It's mm -hmm. not so much in birds of prey then, it's direct ingestion that's causing yeah. the problem. And, 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 and that's poor storage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did see all the, the news coverage of the galahs and the corellas, but how about things like pigeons? Have, have you had any reports? Yeah, look, they will absolutely be have been impacted as well. You know, your cresteds and things that are getting along sort of spill sites. Mm. Um, we've really struggled to get a handle on on deaths. Um, you know, getting getting some information on what's what's been found. Um, it's been really hard to get to get sort of an official some official data on on what's been going on. But there have been those incidental reports that have come through. Absolutely. So I'd suspect that there's actually a range of birds that have been impacted um, through zinc phosphide poisoning, for sure. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's leave broad-scale agriculture aside for a moment. If you are needing to control rodents in your garden, your work shed and your kitchen, how do you, how do, you do it? How do you place the materials? And how do you ensure that the carcasses, corpses, are not ingested by pets or other wildlife? You yep. only have two options. Um, the rat sack with the warfarin in it, which is rat sack double strength, and um, racumin. Uh, those are the only two options uh, that do not have the chemicals that will be passed on uh, to your um, to your dog, to your kids, to the local wildlife. Um, as far as far as placement is concerned, um, rat sack double strength. Does it come with the? I've I've never actually bought it. I think it comes in a little container. The bait box. It? Yeah, it I might come in a, in a bait, bait box. box. So the bait boxes are good, um, but you still have to be careful with of your with, of your dog finding it. Um, so you always put it behind um, or inside a pantry that uh, the dog isn't going to get to. Um, and yeah, the, the same with the rat. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because they can get primary poisoning by eating it themselves. And then you have to go through the whole um, vitamin K um, pills for weeks and weeks to um, uh, build up their um, uh, ability to clot again. Possums like rat sack. 
Yes, they do. Okay. Yep. So that's another, you know, secondary transfer. So this is not always secondary poisoning in wildlife is not always necessarily the birds of prey or corvids or whatever ravens and things eating the dead or dying rats it's working up the food chain from you know possums that are eating the bait directly or you know um, a powerful owl that's feeding on you know another bird that has eaten a rat or in the case of um you know we've seen it in tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles recently in a paper where those birds are not eating the rats directly they you know it's getting up into the food chain and knocking off um, wedgies so it's, it's not just that direct ingestion of the rat that's the issue it's it's getting through the food chain by things that are eating other things and i'm guessing <laughs> macropods also will mm -hmm. if they find it they will eat it quite possibly i'm i'm not i can't say i've heard of it but i'm not i'm not no i haven't, I haven't heard of that yeah i don't know um i do know it's been um uh, i mean we're not talking about the two good guys we're, we're talking about the other bad guys um it's been found in um lizards in the perth region um it's been found uh in insects uh that uh feed uh you know so um cockroaches and uh, beetles and other insects that crawl into the bait boxes and eat the stuff it's themselves. It's been found in those insects. So that means um, if you're using the wrong poison, it can spread everywhere really fast. Even uh, was it found in frogs in that one study? In, no, it was found in snakes, a frog snakes. eating snake. Same. That's what it was. So, um, when these poisons get washed away in the surface water and end up in the um, in streams, then the frogs are eating the insects that are <laughs> that are there, and then the snakes get the the poison dose from the, eating the frogs. So it's. I'm guessing there's probably um, absorption through skin as well. I mean, I, I I don't think you're encouraged to put your hand in uh, in a you know. A, a receptacle of pellets and i imagine that mm. frogs are ingesting it through their skin if it's in the if it's in the environment that that leads me to another question and i don't know if if either of you will will know this but we know we know that it, it is poisoning some things but what kind of monitoring is there <laughs> oh, it, i mean and I'm I'm glad you're laughing because I'm suspecting the answer is zero. Is that is that pretty right? Like none of our regulatory bodies are out there sampling areas where there are plagues to see what is happening. My understanding is the EPA in New South Wales was asking for reports of more than five deaths on a property um, during the plague um, and then testing. Um, for redenticide presence in those. Um, that is, is the only, I, I guess, consistent testing that I know that has been going on by state government. Um, I think it, it's mostly sort of academics and, and things that are mm -hmm. looking at this and, and doing the sampling. It's Maggie, it's, it's Rob Davis and Michael Orr in WA, um, you know, really pushing this issue for sure. So, yeah, we're um, trying to get protocols through the wildlife disease association um so that uh vets who end up with these carcasses know what to do with them um and so we can so start some sort of monitoring to to see um what's happening uh with all of these uh rodenticides that are being dumped into the uh, environment let me throw another curveball to you <laughs> Let's say somebody has you has been using in a broad scale um, application second gen poisons and and an authority um, or some kind some well meaning person collects the stockpiles. Uh, uh, yep. What? How how can they be responsibly disposed of? Not, not the chemical, the corpses. Okay. <laughs> We've got... Oh, that's, a, that's a good one. Isn't it? 
I well, the, the, so the ABC asked you that, did they? Well, the, the the stockpiling of chemicals is an issue we know because there are stockpiles of bromodialone now. The New South Wales mm-hmm. government bought a whole bunch of it, and and then weren't allowed to use it. And then they weren't allowed to use it, so it's just sitting in a shed, many sheds, somewhere, and Wait, waiting to catch fire. Well, waiting to be dispersed. Um, so if if something eats the one of the second generation poisons, uh, you need to collect those corpses, and they need to be um, interred under the ground, um, you know, six feet under or whatever, uh, for at least uh, three hundred days. Okay, so no incineration. You can't be sure that that's not going to release something nasty. Yeah. Um, so, so it's digging a trench, basically. If you've got a lot, uh, if you've got a lot of corpses, because we're talking about mass kill events, aren't we? We're not talking about. Um, I mean, in, in, here at home, I might have seven to ten mm. mice running around. But if you're using it in a in a broad scale sense and the wrong chemical is used, you're likely to have, you know, hundreds, thousands. Thousands. Corpses. So that's where I'm I'm just wondering what, what does someone do if they know they've done the wrong thing, but they now have this residual problem of dead animals? I'm wondering about zinc phosphate. If you burn them, I think that might be dangerous. Um, yeah, that would that would release the gas, and that would be yeah, that would be pretty that'd, toxic for sure. That'd be so, wouldn't it? But bromid xylone um, melts at 172 degrees Celsius, thermally stable below 150 degrees Celsius, flash point 218 degrees Celsius. So depends on how hot your fire is. Um, you could have an explosion. So, so you want to bury them. That's... I think burying is probably the safest. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the same way you'd treat, um, you know, a couple of dead sheep, you would get your backhoe out and you would mm. dig a hole. Make a big trench. Gonna, and it's going to have to be deeper than any dogs or wildlife can get into. And that, and you've got to make sure that it's not um, in any groundwater way because those chemicals will leach out. So the answer is don't use those poisons. That's really the answer. It's pretty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um... So um, the EPA has uh, a PDF on guidance of handling and disposing dead mice. So they say preferred disposal options are via red bin waste collection um, or on-site burial um, they do suggest they do say open air burning, but subject to required repro- repro- uh, approvals and in rural areas mm. with no service. So they're sort of the the three ways that they suggest. But and there's a whole section in this on on farm burials and what to consider. So there's got to be right. two meters between the water table and the base of the pit, two hundred meters from surface water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are so a whole. I've... Sorry. Um, decay yeah. time in soils for bromodialone. Half life in soil ranges. Um, sorry, half life in soil ranges from one point eight to twenty three days, depending on conditions. Um, not readily leached into soils containing organic matter, so not expected to contaminate water supply and aquifers. So that's good. Hmm. That is good. And that's, yeah. Um, and Holly, you were referencing the EPA. That's EPA New South Wales. EPA New South Wales, yes. So, so for other states, you're going to need to check and see yeah, exactly for sure. what the what the regs are. I'm surprised that red bin disposal mm. is, is mm. okay. That uh, that seems to be something about convenience rather than I... uh, being sure that it is not yeah. contaminating other bodies. Yeah, for sure, and I and I can imagine for anybody in a typical urban setting, you know that's gonna that's the way you dispose of dead things. You might put them in a plastic bag and and turf them in the bin. Um, 
and and I think it's you know I think there's there's a massive education issue here that you know people believe because these products are so readily available on the shelves well I mean admittedly I struggled to find a lot of these products during sort of plague season even though I'm not in a plague area because I think the word got out that there are mice everywhere so everybody bought up um, all, all the rodenticides um, and the shelves were, were really really bare and so I think it probably goes into this sort of mass then concern and buying like hoarding of toilet paper you know everybody was hoarding <laughs> rodenticide products they were <laughs> for sure this morning when I went out to get my coffee and support my local my local uh, purveyor of caffeine, uh, I went to the supermarket and I was in the aisle with my camera about to take a picture mm -hmm. of the shelf and a employee of said supermarket tapped me on the shoulder and said, no. So That's a bit weird. It is a bit weird, but there's obviously a sensitivity um, because, of course, you're in that bay with the uh, the stuff, the chemicals, the uh, the garden chemicals and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I didn't labour the point and I didn't go back and you know, take the hat off or whatever and go and do it again. <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was interesting. And uh, in a former life, I worked for a garden company and sold those chemicals and placed them into supermarkets and whatnot. And even though we did have the safety data sheets, we were never trained as part of the company about which were good and which were bad. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I want to sort of go next. But is there anything... Um, Anything more that really needs to be said about choosing and using rodenticides that we haven't already smoothed out? Well, Bird Life Australia has that lovely um, page that says... Yeah. So we've got a, a, a page, it's actforbirds.org forward slash rat poison, um, where you can get all sorts of information. It's got the chemicals to, to go for if you do... Um, want to be if you do need to bait and I guess in a typical garden household setting um, leaving rural plague situations aside I guess you need to basically assess whether you need to bait at all so how substantial is the issue that you've got um, what are the steps that you can take before you get um, rodents around the place so is there you know if you've got chooks like I do it pretty much guarantees that you're going to have um, some mice and rats getting around um, but you know trying to go with sort of no spill containers if you've got um, if you're feeding pets outside likewise making sure everything's nice and sealed up um, that you're sort of minimizing um, opportunities for, for rodents around your place um, you know if you've got palms keeping them relatively tidy and things because rats seem to love getting in amongst them um, so, so making sure that you're keeping things relatively um, clean around the place so you're minimising the chance that you've got the infestation to begin with. And then if you do find that you've got um, rats and mice around the place and you need to get rid of them, nobody wants them hanging around. And, you know, they can be a health risk as well. So there's there's no problem with, with dealing with the issue. It's considering what your best options are. So do you, do you have to bait? Go with some snap traps. You know, I, I think that, that people probably go with for the bait option for the very option reason that we don't want the baits used um, in that the rodents go away and die somewhere else. And so you don't have to deal with a dead carcass. It's not fun. Um, but unfortunately, because of the vast majority of the, the products on the shelves of those second gen rodenticides, the fact that these rodents are going away and dying somewhere else is a massive problem. Well, that's, that um, is the problem. That's exactly it. Um, so even putting them in a roof cavity, you know, putting your baits in a roof cavity, great. It means the dogs and things can't get access. But if you're using a second generation red endicide, the rats are going to eat the bait and then they are going to go off somewhere else. They're not going to stay within the cavity for the most part and die there. They're going to be venturing out into the garden and whatnot and, 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 and be found somewhere else. So, you know, looking at, at snap traps as, a, as another option, 
Um, if you do need to bait because, you know, you've got quite a large infestation that you need to deal with, then like we've been talking about all session, it's those first generation rodenticides. It's the warfarin and the kutramol that I can never pronounce <laughs> that one. Those are the active ingredients to look for. Um, but still, as Maggie said, making sure that you're um, keeping the products away from dogs and kids. They are still rodenticides. They are still highly toxic. Um, it just has less of a chance of ending up in um, in amongst wildlife as a second gen as as a, a secondary poisoning event. And um, have I have I got that? Uh, can you see the ticket? The ticket yes. that I've got going. Yep, got that's it. Right? So you can go to that, and then there'll, there'll be a, a rat poison page there. There's all sorts of information. There's some of the research that we've got going on. There's a, a downloadable brochure. You can advertise that you've got an owl-friendly garden because you're not using those products. There's all sorts of stuff there for the people to check out. Fantastic. I'm just going to edit that because I've just um, I just grabbed. <laughs> hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. While I'm doing, while I'm doing that, um, we hadn't really talked about this, but I'd like to talk about some of the other pest control that people might need to use in a garden or domestic situation. Um, are we okay to? to sort of venture into snails and um, mm. and rabbits and foxes, uh, things like that, of what the preferred um, preferred methods should be or the preferred uh, compounds? Sure. I, I admit that, that some of it's not my area, but I can do my best. Um, we know... Pindone is is the chemical that's most rodents or the anticoagulant that's mostly used for um, rabbits, um, and it has chances of secondary poisoning as well. Um, so you know, any of those those things can be an issue. Um, I guess with any chemical that you're putting out in the garden, you want to do some research on what the active ingredient is. Um, um, and avoiding them where possible because you know snails and slugs, are not fun to have around the garden, especially if you've got a veggie patch. But they're great food for blue tongue lizards and and other and birds and things as well. So you want to be trying to create a garden where the wildlife can do the pest management for you, um, rather than you needing to add anything in particular to it. Um, so I would always look at anything to control those, especially invertebrates, so insects and things. Um, as a last resort um, because they are such vital members of the, the web of life within a garden um, that there will be something coming to feed on them. So um, uh, putting in anything chemical to control them as a, as a last resort. Now, the, the old, um, the old favourite snails and slugs, what? The, those pellets are incredibly dangerous for dogs and mm -hmm. uh, possums. Um, they just, um, you, you might as well be putting out the poison for them. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know why they're even available. Well, that, that's really the, the issue, isn't it? That, um, I mean, having been someone who, you know, trained as a horticulturist and, and, was selling for a long time, both in a um, uh, in my own nursery and working for others. Um, it's just bad. They, these things are just bad. Um, yeah, it's a metal metal de, me, me, metaldehyde. That's it. <laughs> I can say it. Metaldehyde. The, but there's so many other other things which we are learning a lot later um, are, are just bad in out there in the environment. Glyphosate, mm. which I know, is something that you don't 
want on your on your skin at all. Um, I remember when Confidor, which I think is a nic nicot nicotinoid, I think, pest control, which was a systemic. Mm -hmm. Now, I was working, excuse me, for the company that was selling it in Australia when it was released in a beautiful green uh, trigger pack. And it was marketed as um, the least worst kind of option. But, uh, and well, the, um, the sellers of um, glyphosate, uh, they used to um, they'd drink it. They'd say, it's so safe, you can drink it. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a land agent I know um, who was telling me these stories, you know, back in the 80s. They'd be like, oh, yeah, so safe, you can drink it. <laughs> oh, well, when, how'd that work out for them? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to know. When I was working in, um, uh, in, in horticulture, in maintenance horticulture and also production horticulture, if we were using fungicides we would kit right up mm. the the suit the, the the tissue suit then the plastic waterproof suit the visor the breathing apparatus but never when we were using uh glyphosate i mean glyphosate you'd wear maybe gloves maybe some goggles but not the full rest no no you'd be striding around in your thongs <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, um and also all the kind of old, the old remedies, you know, cop copper sulfate and all those kind of things for your fruit trees and, and what mm. uh, we were just very, very careless about things. And, and I must say, even though I've been a bird lover since I was a kid, I didn't give any of these issues very mm. deep thought when I was working in that in industry because you just get sucked into it, which I guess is why... It's the marketing. Which is why we're talking about it now, yeah. and, and I'll talk about it until the day I die, about what people are, are using and doing, even if it is less harmful. It's, it's all it, about money. It, well, it, even if you can use the friendliest product possible, it's still better to do it than use any. It's better to use some other form of intervention if you can. Mm. Especially um, if you if you're around the home, there's 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 generally um, a, a really safe alternative. You know, send your kid out with a bucket to gather up some snails and have a bit of fun. Um, you know, the, there's there's ways to 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 manage these issues for the most get part. Some ducks. Get some yeah. ducks. Get some that'll, ducks. That'll get rid of your snail problem real quick. Um, what uh, Maggie I, I, again I'm, I'm we haven't prepared for this we haven't talked about it before but <laughs> um, but what what are the what are some of the really bad compounds that are commonly available for a poor cultural use you would say to just totally avoid um well, I don't know if you remember uh, uh, Peter Kundal from. I do uh, remember Peter Kundal, yes. the fantastic uh, Tasmanian ABC guard. Oh, um, I, I I love the man. Um, yeah, same, he was a hero of mine. Every uh, everything that I learned about gardening, I learned from him. Um, so as a gardener, it's like basically, if you can't pick it off. By, by yourself, then you, you grab the bad guy and you crush it up and you spray it on there to make <laughs> things go away. You cultivate the, the, um, uh, the insects that will eat the insects that you're trying to deal with. Um, fungus, there's always some other alternative. So I'd, and I pretty much say don't use any chemicals at all in, in your garden um, because it's just not worth the risk. We just don't have enough information in terms of the risk of any chemical uh, that's available, uh, mostly because a lot of these um, are used, uh, sorry, I was just reading the thing. Um, yeah. A lot of these are used, are, are chemicals that were developed so long ago before we had 
um, the, the data sheet before we even investigated it. Um, it's just stuff that you used from the 1940s, and it works. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bit like aspirin. So um, if someone discovered aspirin today and tried to get it um, registered as a drug, it would never make it because it's so dangerous. Tess, welcome aboard. Thanks for your comment. Um, I, I, ne I nearly chuckled when we're talking about dead things in the local cemetery. Pindone <laughs> being used in local cemetery to take out rabbits. Mm -hmm. they spread so um, the, 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 the carrot lacing thing is a big, has been a big problem in this area here. Um, I'm in Albury uh, region. So in the 70s and 80s, a huge uh, carrot lacing pro program um, was done. Uh, and there are farms still today that don't have any possums left because they were all killed by Pindon. Just struggling with the words a bit. Because I, I, I wonder why, why that is a method that is preferred for rabbits. It, it, is it just because of the cost of uh, mechanical control, um, you know, ripping or collapsing burrow uh, warrens and and whatnot uh, is. Uh, are the pellets into warrens a better control measure than than poisoning with pindone and, and baits for them? Is do do we have a do we have a view on rabbit control? Khaleesi works really well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, I don't think I can really speak for land managers that, that decide to employ that method. I would suggest that it probably is a more cost-effective mm -hmm. um, tool because you can put them out and, and walk away. You don't have to, you know, be out there for hours, you know, with heavy machinery and, and things. And, you know, somewhere in an urban setting like that, it's probably not possible to, to get, you know, sort of the machinery and things in or, you know, you can't do sort of, sh you can't do shooting or anything like that in those sort of settings. Um, so it's probably a combination of the cost um, and the time to, to deploy baits versus other methods, as well as the restrictions when you're working in an urban setting of what you can actually... Um, get on ground mm. too, I would suggest. But yes, the secondary poisoning um, uh -huh. uh, is a huge risk in, yep. in using pin down. Um, and um, yes, the blue tongues, possums, um, anything to get in. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd even probably push it a bit further. Um, my neighbours throw their leftover dinner in the park I throw out seed. My neighbours throw out noodles and whatnot. Um, they, yep, they also throw out um, vegetables, and the local cockatoos love carrots. Mm -hmm. They love yep. carrots. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't like to be seeing people throwing out carrots into areas where galahs and cockatoos might be hanging out. Um, and I imagine if the pieces are small enough, your carawongs and crows are all going to get uh, get into it, ravens and whatnot yep. too. So, For sure. Yep. So, um, yeah. I mean, look, it, it's a vexed problem, isn't it? Because we don't want the pest, but but sometimes you know, a, a rabbit's in the cemetery really that bad? I mean, well, it's because they're European rabbits. Uh, so European rabbits burrow and they make warrens. Um, if they, if the, um, the forefathers had brought in um, American rabbits who don't do that, then you wouldn't be having this discussion. <laughs> well, let, well let, let, let's go to another monumental disaster mistake. Foxes. <sighs> so the, the Victorian Acclimatization Society has a lot, a lot to, to answer, answer for. <laughs> Blackberries, wi wi weeping willows, uh, foxes. Uh, I think they introduced monkeys to one area. Black, 
<laughs> blackbirds, of course. We've yep. Got, uh, blackbirds, blackbirds, yeah. We've got our sparrows. I mean, don't, sparrows. Don't, leave, don't leave the sparrows out. <laughs> Starlings. Yeah. Uh, and look, I'm, I'm far less of a, um, of a hater on the introduced birds than I used to be when I was younger. Mm. And, and in fact, I did. I did see someone's post on Twitter that um, uh, that uh, Mr. Dooley uh, commented on about the song crush. I quite like the song crush, but but I'd much. Well, rather but there's have... only a handful of them left, so. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> but I'd much rather have the ground thrush hanging around <laughs> than the song thrush and the blackbird. Uh, I'd like some whistlers, please, over here. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. I, would, I, I mean. <laughs> We don't even have yellow robins here. So, um, uh, um, so foxes, What if somebody needs to get into fox control? Now, I only know of fox off. Um, what can you tell me about that, Maggie? Um, so there's, there's two ways of getting, well, three, I guess, if you, uh, three ways of getting rid of a fox. One, you, you kill it with a bait. Uh, like a 1080 or um, uh, whatever um, sort of thing, which is problematic in some ways because it's not the nicest death on the planet. Um, the uh, uh, what's he? What's he? What's he? Having your brain blown out by a 202 bullet. <laughs> it's quick. So so if if we're talking about humane, we, we were talking about quick death. Um, so um, sharpshooter. Um, they they very rarely miss. I've seen pig shooters um, go after cats, and you know they they can take out twenty feral cats uh, from a helicopter, uh, and it's like it's the most amazing thing to see. Anyway, so you know sharp shooting really isn't an option in a, mor- in a morbid kind of way. In, in a morbid kind of way. Yeah, in a morbid awful kind of way. Yeah, but you are cleaning um, up the environment. <laughs> uh, so the the other one, um, so fox off is 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 ten eighty. Uh, on the one hand, it's not bad because it is derived from natural chemicals. It breaks down easily. But on the other hand, it's not a nice death, and you always risk um, domestic dogs getting into it. There is a chemical that was developed um, on Phillip Island that I still haven't seen used widely uh, that is an abortifactant. Uh, So an abortifactant... Uh, it's a canine abortifactant, so you the it's like a um, it's put in a bait. The animal eats it, and if they happen to be a canine, like a fox or a dog, then they uh, all their pups abort, and so you kill by attrition, and it takes several generations, uh, and so that's an option to use in areas where. Um, high risk areas of, of secondary poisoning for um, for domestic dogs uh, because otherwise um, I mean you just have to put signs out as, as well saying if your dog eats this bait and it's a breeding um, dog then you're in trouble um, you're gonna lose your pups but that's easier than 1080 okay um, I've just uh, done a search on Phillip Island for foxes and um... Yeah, I'm not seeing anything there. Just, um, just den fumigation. Now, I'm, ima- I'm imagining that den fumigation is uh, is problematic as mm-hmm. well for those those chemicals. I would say. Do you know what that would be? No, I don't know what that one is. Um... What they use there, trying to find the um, abortifactant that they. I'm going to pest smart. That might have have some more info on that. Um, that's the Centre for Invasive Species, so that might have a bit more. Uh, yeah. uh, knockdown cleanup. So I'm not seeing the the uh, abortion method there. So um, I'm looking on the it must so be queen. Very limited. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
the chemical abort affected. Here we go. Um, cabergoline, C A B E R G O L I N E, C A B E G O L I N E. Selective that's selective just for canines, so mm. uh, so cats aren't, aren't at risk. Um, Correct. I'm, I'm imagining that's a very strictly controlled chemical so that you probably can't rock on down mm. the shoulders or... Yeah. No, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't. But it's, uh, uh, it needs to be used in conjunction with other forms of control um, because otherwise you're always getting um, new vixens coming into the area. So you basically, um, when you... So an island is really a good place to do that because you can uh, shoot out as many as you can, and then you lay out the, abort, uh, the, the chemical abortifactant, and then uh, that kind of cleans up any else, um, and then and you can restrict. Uh, so on, on Phillip Island, um, they, they've gotten to the point now where they just have one officer who's got dogs who combs the island um, every few weeks with dogs that have been trained to hunt out foxes to make sure that um, none get across uh, the island on um, the San Remo Bridge. Yeah. Um, here we go. Tess has Tess uh, given us another comment. What's she got? <laughs> oh, look, she's even said something nice. <laughs> <laughs> even though we've okay. realised her worst fears. Sorry, no, yes. Tess. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's when you start thinking about all the chemicals that we use, then you're just like, <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, I think the the principles that that I was taught when I studied horticulture are the things we need to always bear in mind. I think, and that's the principles of integrated pest management. There is no silver bullet, and nothing is nothing is easy. And if you can use the the principle of tread lightly in any decision that you that you make. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So, so Tess has uh, Tess has just given me another message. Where I think we, I think we definitely did say your worst with your worst fears, Tess. We, we, I, I wasn't I wasn't meaning to say that you thought it was good that we were. Um, um, okay. So here I've. Facing I've just read um, about the fumigation technique in the dens, and that's carbon dioxide. Um, so that's not bad, but the problem happens that you don't, um, because the den isn't, you know, just one room. It's like yeah. fingers. There's lots of fingers, and yeah. and it's all airtight. So you end up, you can end up with pockets of air, and it doesn't work. So it's a lot of work for not much gain. I mean, well, fox eradication is very, very difficult. Otherwise, we probably would have eradicated foxes in the 70s when when all the mm. governments were getting together and trying to do it. Um, yeah. And don't forget, there's the um, Sydney Fox Rescue Society that yeah. we have to deal with. Well, yeah. Look, um, don't, don't get me started. I mean, look at all the money that's going into saving dogs in Bali. I mean, oh, there I go again. Can you put that it into the bloody region honey eater or something if you don't mind? There he yeah, goes yeah, again. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, look, everyone, it, it, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah I just, um, we got some pretty serious problems here. Uh, mm. like, I'd like the Indonesians to look after Indonesia. And I don't get me wrong. I speak Indonesian and I love Indonesia, but you know, please, please, can we do something about the helmet and honey eater? Actually, Holly, let me go <gasps> completely off script. The um, helmet and honey eater isn't a species. <laughs> no, it's a subspecies. Now, no, no, it isn't. It's, oh, the, end it's, it's the end of a cline. It's the end of a cline. It doesn't. Have... <laughs> this is the evolutionary biologist of okay, me okay, speaking. No, no, go, Maggie. Go. Let, 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 Let's talk about this because, because this is one of those things where, where, where the issue about where resources should go is, yeah. is really, really important. Now, sometimes I say, should we even bother saving a species? Now, that's not, my, that's not a point I put out. 
I, mm-hmm. I, I'm saying I agree with. But when when is it important to to say something? <laughs> and the helmet and honey eater, Maggie, go. This is controversy. I like it. It is. It is. It is very. Um, so if you look at um, the uh, yellow, yellow tufted, tufted honey. honey Okay, so if you look at the map of the yellow tufted honey eater, um, it starts up north and it, and the the range comes all the way south and ends up in this um, uh, in Victoria. Uh, and if you look at the size of the tuft, uh, it follows um, uh, an, uh, uh, this rule of of uh, of what we call a cline. And um, it's a spatial gradient in a specific singular trait. So if you look at the um, yellow tufted honey eater in its northern part of its range and you put it next to um, the, hel- the, the helmeted honey eater, if you, if you put them next to each other, you, you would go, oh, well, they're definitely a different species because they're so different. But the fact is that they're, uh, they exchange genetic material uh, along that whole cline. And so you're just seeing one trait that's exaggerated, but it actually isn't any different than that one that's way up north. And so from an evolutionary point of view, you're not actually losing genetic diversity by letting the less tufty ones subsume the, 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 the helmeted honey eater. But that's kind of taking the long lineage look that doesn't necessarily sit very well with Victoria. <laughs> well, well it's, it, it's one of those interesting things. And sorry if you're, um, if you're watching just for pesticide stuff. But, um, <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> but, um, you know... It's, it's one of these decisions that people have to make. And, mm. you know, I know, I know it's drawing a long bow, but if you're an a, a open space manager, what you use for pest control or weed control, geez, weeds, that's, that's <laughs> next, that's next, um, is, is a decision that you have, has so many different factors that can affect it. I want to hear what you think about this, Holly. Which populations are worth are worth putting energy into saving? Mm. Gosh, <laughs> on a on, on a climb. Oh wow! Yeah, oh, that's that's a massive philosophical, ethical, financial. Everything is wrapped up in that decision, and 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 I don't think that there is one easy solution. Um, it can depend on whereabouts you sit on the spectrum of, of your feelings on yeah. on the ethics of saving everything and knowing that that's not actually, unfortunately, possible. possible. No. Um, so I guess, you, you know, you need to, you know, as a, a land manager or, um, you know, uh, running a program or, or deciding on what birds or other wildlife to save, you know, is is going to always be influenced by the people involved. You know, I, mm. I don't think it can ever be a clinical right answer for for this. Um, we are always going to be influenced by people's emotions, um, and that is ultimately going to drive um, decision making. Unfortunately, I don't think you can get a, you can't get away from from people's hearts in these sorts of decisions, um, and that can be a really good thing and it can be a really hard thing as well. Um, and so I guess that's, you know, one of the reasons I love my job in urban birds is not because I don't have to make those hard decisions because threatened species use urban spaces, but I'm not dealing with, you know, some of the, you know, Regent honey eaters and orange bellied parrots and things that are in really dire straits. Um, and but, and, yep, helmet honey eaters. Um, <laughs> <Not> a species. <laughs> but... Um, I think there is great value in interventions before things get to that point. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I'm often talking about keeping common birds common and, um, you know, not dealing with hyper abundant problem species, but we, we want to, wherever we can, not be getting to the point where you are down to that critical decision making and things are in incredible dire straits and you're starting to look at whether it is actually viable to save a population um, yep. or a species as a whole. Um, those interventions need to be made way before that really hard decision um, needs to be made. And, and that's not even one decision that's influenced by the financial, the, the, the grant funding that's available and, um, you know, the, the staff that are, are available and who the landholders are. There's, it's an incredibly complex system. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons I think that, that, that working in urban birds and conserving things in gardens is so important because it's keeping things common and it's keeping people connected. Um, and we can't expect people to care about and be passionate about in in the grand scheme of things some of these little brown birds that live oh, somewhere well. else um if LBJs. they don't care about them, yeah if they don't care about the things that are around them you know that, that that's their first interaction with birds and with nature in a lot of cases especially as we're in, you know so many of us are in lockdown <laughs> That's, that's our interaction and that's our connection to nature and that's really, really, um, really, really vital to keep maintaining. Um, and so where issues like rodenticide become really important as well because this is, like, like you said, Grant, this is not something that a lot of people think about because these products are available on the mm. shelf to deal with a problem. And, that's and so... Lean in to Tess's comment, which I did want to comment on, having been, hey, Tess... I'm an ex Bunnings buddy too, mate. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, a very, uh, very interesting management style of Bunnings. Um, so, one th maybe you can answer this, Mr. Bunnings. Um, so, in in the U.S., we have this invasive ant called a fire ant. Yep. Um, that came up. Um, We've got that here uh, too, haven't we? Now, in, in yeah, the unfortunately. Um, yep. The, the great entomologist E.O. Wilson discovered it when he was like um, 11 years old in Texas and wrote his first paper, I think, at 12. Anyway, um, so one of the, the best ways to control fire ants um, in, your, in your yard uh, is uh, something called borax. So yep. borax is this chemical that we used to, you know, you can, you can buy it in the laundry room. You can buy you can buy it yeah, in yeah. in the laundry aisle because it it, yeah. it makes things happen in your in your washing machine. That's right. It's really hard to get borax here in Australia. Why? It's perfect for ants. It doesn't do anything bad. All it does is kind of make them blow up. <laughs> it's not a I chemical think... that kills them. It just makes them blow up. I I don't I don't know the actual answer but i have a supposition and that is borax is slash was cheap so why sell borax at a dollar <laughs> fifty for 500 grams if you can sell someone something for 17 dollars in a shiny lovely uh trigger pack i think that's the answer dang and and tess Tess, Tess's comment is spot on. If if I could recommend to someone an easy mechanical or intervention uh, to solve a problem, most customers wanted me to put one or two trigger packs in their hands. And that's exactly what Tess has said. Chemicals are what everyone wants, even for ants at the letterbox. And, yep, having worked there and having worked for a major company selling potting mix and fertilisers and pest control and supplements and whatnot, that's it. Uh, there's a huge apparatus behind it, but every consumer wants to walk in and walk out with a solution in a mm -hmm. plastic trigger pack or in a bag. So you're saying we need to do societal change? Well, easy. Well, you know, 
people are still still don't have com- compost heaps mm. and and worm farms in every backyard. So so all those potato peelings are still going into landfill and still releasing methane and, and whatnot as they break down. We have not we have not been able to counter the commercial interests in doing mm. sweet FA. Um, and I think that... Uh, and that must be w- why bromodialone is sitting in those mm-hmm. silos somewhere in New South Wales, because there must have been more money in bromodialone for somebody yep. than um, the, the zinc phosphide, which had been already approved through the CSIRO work. There was a sales rep somewhere banking mm. on banking on next year's holiday from that commission. That, mm. that, that, I mean, that's a whole different issue about how things are sold and how people are rewarded for selling products. But unfortunately, you can't separate uh, the, the con- consumer behaviour and also the profit of the suppliers and distributors. So it's a, we're never going to solve, solve the issue until, well, it's, it's the big thing for me is that you can't do everything, but do something. So, um, so if you haven't got a compost heap, start one, Peter Cundall, go back and look at all of the ABC gardening, uh, how to's. Um, he was and, the best. And if you do have a compost heap that works, great. If you have one that doesn't work, work out how to make it work. It's not too difficult. And if you have a compost heap and you don't have a worm farm, get a worm farm. Or chickens. Yeah, if you can have chickens. We can't have chickens here, unfortunately. But uh, um, we're allowed to have one, I think. Um Oh, that's socially horrible. Yeah, well, basically, because so many people around here have uh, have had roosters and there was a fucking mm. cocks and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, think, I think my municipality just says don't have any. I don't think we're allowed to have ducks, but I used to have ducks when I was a kid. And when you got ducks, you don't have snails and slugs. You just don't have them. Um, Harlequin bugs. I mean, controlling controlling insects and controlling weeds, um, are there are there really really bad chemicals, Maggie? That we just that just should not be in anybody's household for these two. Uh, Harlequin yeah. bugs. Let's say. Oh, um... well, let, 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 let's say insects generally. You know, you've got Harlequin bugs are one that are, uh, in some parts of Melbourne are really difficult. Um, I don't think they do that much trouble. But problem people just don't like them. They're stinky. Um. So you've got uh, the pyrethrum sprays, which are fine. Those are um, pyrethrum is based off of Dandelion. marigolds. Uh, sorry, uh, marigolds. Well, it's a- asteraceae. A lot of asteraceae family plants um, have the pyrethrum, pyrethroid, pyrethroid yes. or whatever they are. So, yeah. Um, Any, anything that's got um, that sort of chemical in it is usually fine. Um, let's see. Uh, rotenone is the other one. Um, and that one, odorless, colorless crystal, broad spectrum, occurs naturally in the seeds of some plants. Interfering with electron transport chain. Oh, that sounds good. That, that sounds good. We should be able to market that. Yeah. <laughs> Moderately hazardous. Oh, uh, ex- extremely toxic to fish and insects. Oh, no, let's not use that. So, yeah. Uh, at what you're looking at now, are there any brand names there that, to be avoided? Um. Ooh, might cause Parkinson's disease. Nice. What? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... that's so, rotenone. No. Um, 
Darius Dust. Oh, Dar yeah, Darius Dust. We used to use that on the cabbages for the um, cabbage white. Mm, don't. Okay, yeah. Um, don't. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of all the names of the stuff I used to sell. Darius Dust was out there. Carbaryl. Of course, you had Confidor. Um, all the aphid, aphids stuff. Just, there's really there's really always an organic it. way of dealing yeah, with these yeah, things. Yeah, there's yeah. always another method. Really, really nasty systemic uh, things. And um, uh, di dimethylate was another one. <laughs> Dipel. Um, I remember working in grounds, uh, parks and gardens, grounds, ma grounds management. We used to use this thing called paraquat, which is just shocking. Um, but they're still using it. That's, um, Paraquat was selective, I think, for, um, for I've got to get this right, I think it was selective for, for monocots, not dicots. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um. yeah oh, horrible stuff. Um, I think, I think, so, I think, uh, I might have, I might have it the wrong way around, but I think, I think so that was what we used to control, like onion weed and whatnot. And uh, I can't remember what we used. For Highly it. toxic to mammals, yeah. acute oh, respiratory so distress. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So mechanical intervention with weeds is certainly the, the way to go, isn't it? And, and composting. And, and that's, that's a, um, one thing that we haven't really talked about is the other ways of controlling mouse plagues. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's, let's talk about that. Let, let, let's uh, go back to rodents. Let's go back to rodents. <laughs> Since I've managed to take us all the way around the block. <laughs> so um, uh, the CSRO came out with years ago a um, how-to guide, and I haven't been able to track it down. Um, I found it once, and it's like disappeared into the uh, internet ether. Uh, and they had this whole list of things that they had tested of, of basically, here's how you, first of all, you um, see if there's going to be a mouse plague happening. So they've got these like chew cards that you can like scatter oh, around your, so you your fields. Many, how many you've yeah. Yeah. yeah, see how many you've got. And then you, then you can run these like simple calculations of, okay, well, now I've got to do an intervention. Um, but some of the other ones are really cool. Uh, so um, low till or no till um, farming is actually really bad because it leaves the mouse dens uh, in place. So if you've got an infestation, then you go and you deep, deep um, till your land um, it, because that then just messes up um, all the all the nesting and and farmers need to be start looking at that now. Um, because we're having an early spring, which means that normally breeding starts in September, but it's probably going to start in late August this year. Um, and the other one that uh, was really cool is something called a decoy crop. So the thing that triggers mice to go plague uh, has to do with the, co the quality of the diet that they're eating. So you've got this whiz-bang wheat product that's got a bajillion bits of fat in all of those seeds and that's the really high quality stuff that's going to make you a lot of money and so you plant your whole um, farm out in this stuff um, the mice are like mm, oh this is really good oh it's got a lot of fat oh I'm going to plague and they start plaguing and plaguing and plaguing but mice don't go very far so if you um, plant a ring of really low quality crap food in like one swathe of your machine around your whole crop, the mice don't go past that. They're like, oh, it's crap. I guess we'll not plague this year. And it's crap um, neighborhood. We're not going yeah. to this neighborhood. Oh, I'm not going over there. That's not, it's not worth my while. And so then you don't. Um, and so if, yes, you lose as a farmer, you lose the, um, that amount of your field or your, um, your paddock. You don't have the cost in but the, yeah, surely against the cost of yeah, surely, the the rodenticides and the yeah, yeah you'd come yeah, out ahead for sure. I think that the CSIRO did that in the seventies or eighties. They did um, some field trials, um, and uh, in you know it's not one hundred percent. Nothing's one hundred percent. So, but so what? So one slasher width, or one yeah. or, or, or one um, cultivator width is actually enough to deter the movement, is it? 
Um, yeah, so two two is better, but you know it's like a cost benefit analysis sort of thing. Um, are you are you willing to lose that? Um, how many slashers width are you willing to lose to save the 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 crop on the inside? That that's something I hadn't I hadn't heard of. I, I'm I'm kind of really surprised that that such a small distance is enough to deter the movement of of our little friendly rodents. Um, so a, a mouse won't move more than 100 metres in its entire life. Wow. Now, um, again, Maggie, I, I'm, I'm probably uh, stretching the, the bounds of friendship. Here, it's not, I know it's not really your, your area, but, but do you know if um, our native um, species that occupy the same niche as the house mouse. Do you know if they are similarly uh, geographically challenged, shall we say? Uh, so, yes. Um, and there is anecdotal information that they used to plague like the house mouse did until they were um, overcome by the, the new invader. Um, so, yes. Uh, there's a lot of mammals that are very limited. And so um, Holly was talking about keeping common species common. And that's um, uh, something that um, we've been talking about um, for years now is, you know, you're, you're, um, you're doing all this reveg and, um, uh, and you, it, you build it and you expect them to come. And that's fine for birds who might be able to cross that matrix of other stuff. But if you want to keep common species common, you're going to have to do some targeted um, relocation. Uh, the marsupial mice, um, lizards that aren't going to cross uh, that 1K distance um, because they just don't. And, and you, you do need to think about it then, uh, about that sort of thing. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of species that are, uh, that are not vagile. Uh, that's the technical term for it. They just don't move very well across a matrix. Yeah. Just freestyling, you know. This is, this is, that's how we roll. Uh, wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I need some coffee. Uh, why? Why do you think it is that, well, I'm, I was a, I was a kid concerned about all this stuff in the 70s and, and the early 80s. All these kind of issues were being talked about then. Why is it that we still, when people build new roads and stuff like that, why don't we have a wildlife underpass, a corridor or an overpass or, or whatnot? What? You don't live in Brisbane, do you? Mm. Um, no, well, I know, I know, I know. We've got the koala things in some particular locations, but why is it that every major road redevelopment, um, subdivision, whatever, does not have just as the same as you're going to run pipes down your drains and and in your services? Why is every road, every path? not able to be safely traversed by lizards and uh you all get put up a dollar sign yeah i can, <laughs> I can tell i mean i mean we know that i mean we know that that is yes. the we know that's the answer but i i mean there, a, there's a, it, a length you're in the wrong pipe, country you're in the wrong country pipe costs 11 dollars retail you know well, <laughs> it just it just astounds me that that you can sell a blue tongue lizard in a pet shop mm. for what twenty bucks, thirty bucks, but we don't ascribe the value to that thing in the bush to be able to travel across a road. I so there's there's a lot there's a lot of research that's been done in this space, um, especially for reptiles, because um, a reptile doesn't view the environment the same way that that you do, and so they've 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 trialed different uh, passageways for turtles, especially because um, a lot of turtles won't enter in an underpass if it's got 
too much shadow, etc. Uh, and uh, so they, they do a lot of this in the U.S. and Florida and the southern states because of the, um, the roads that traverse swamps. Um, and that, so they found, and on the East Coast, they've found a certain shape will allow turtles to go underneath. In, um, in Spain, they're very concerned about their lizards, and so they build overpasses. Um, and in Brisbane, they've got that amazing one um that is it, it just looks like a forest over the road uh and birds use it and lizards use it and snakes use it and and but it's just so new and who's gonna pay for it well the developer i mean i mean, the, I mean the, but that but that means that the that the environmental impact statement has to have it in there that that's yeah. uh, a mitigation yeah. but nobody knows about it it just it just astounds me that we 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 have news items just about every night. House prices in Melbourne, re- record prices, and it's always good news for homeowners, right? Uh, it's terrible. It doesn't matter which side of the coin you look at it. It's good news for one sector. It's bad news for another. Um, no, prices go up. I mean, surely we. Should factor in wildlife by now this is what i i get frustrated on and i bore my friends silly because i'm always crapping on about what why well you you've got to find the ear you've got to find the ear of the environment minister of the federal environment minister you've got to find that person's minders and you've got to so uh i Met her I know. A, couple, I, a couple of weeks ago, she's, and she's apparently a lovely lady. She just doesn't do anything. The last, <laughs> but but the the had... well, the West Australian lady. Hmm. Um. So the the minder told me that the website of the environment minister, there's a a, a, a box of send it send me um, a question or whatever. If yeah. you say, I'm. Holly Parsons, I'm in BirdLife Australia. Um, here's what you need to know about rodents, uh, rodenticides. Um, you know, and you do a dot point as though you were briefing the minister herself. Then, then she gets it. So it's like, okay, uh, here's here's a specific road, and um, here's a specific way to do a mitigation strategy that will help this animal, this animal, this animal build an overpass, build an underpass. Here's a link to a paper that has done it in Spain. Thank you. Good night. Okay. So, so because because I don't, I don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to mm. be. I don't, I don't want to be the bloke on the sidelines, carping and carping and carping. I I want. To <laughs> Even though that's me. Solutions to whoever needs to hear them. Yeah. The, the, the problem. Uh, the problem that I find, I'll give you an example. I've reached out to a couple of the zoos about some mm. of the recent captive breeding and translocation uh, programs. Now, they won't talk to me. Mm. Now, now, That's now, not unusual. <laughs> no, no. Well, well but, this, but this is a problem. It's because they're part funded by government and they want to control the message that goes out. I turn it around and say, hey, you were part funded by government. Your stuff isn't state secrets. If, if what you did didn't work, people should know about it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't reflect badly on Taronga Zoo or Melbourne Zoo if you had a go. But the community should know what works, what doesn't work, where the bang for bucks is going rather than the best PR job gets funded and and that's my sort of problem with it how do mm. I find how do I find the information to then go through the minister's press secretary and all that kind of stuff because I tried very hard to make contact with the uh, minister's office and invite her on the show they don't 
they don't really. I, I doubt whether the messages mm. that they took um, have gone anywhere other than the round receptacle. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that... <laughs> yeah. No, they, it's it's not, it's not genuine, and that's why I roll my eyes and shrug my shoulders. There's no good faith. Mm -mm. I mean, Holly, you might remember. I'm not sure, Maggie, if you do, but remember we had once we had a liberal environment minister who went and went and waged war basically at the international whaling commission mm. i think i think i think that's the last time we had a conservative environment minister with a backbone but keen keen he's not federal but yeah but but he but he just took 25 percent out of saving our species so so yeah, Matt, Matt Keane. But, he, but... He, he's doing some things, but on the other hand, he's a performance artist. That, that's yes, my problem. So... You, 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 you don't go, here's New National Park, but I've taken 25% of the money that, that goes to saving the rare animals and plants in that National Park. Here, have a National Park, but we're not going to save... Or we're not going to continue to to put the same effort into preserving the endangered and threatened species that we've already spent ten years identifying and working out how to manage. That's performance art for me. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, Matt Keane. I again, I've I've invited through his office to talk to me. No response, but. I don't want it. I don't want any of these people to be to be villains because they've all got the power to make change. Mm -hmm. So just make change, please. Um, I don't care what badge you wear, whether it's a red one or a blue one or a bloody green <laughs> one. Just... Do do something, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, so it's incredibly frustrating. I don't know. I mean, and and hey, I'm just I'm just Joe. I'm just Joe Public. I mean. For you guys, who your careers are based on all these issues, and you've got to fight each other to get bloody five thousand bucks, it's insane. That that's why the the developers need to pay. That's my view. The developers need to pay because that's where the profit is. Mm. Sure. Um, so there is. Um... University of Melbourne, I think I sent you guys the link just there. So University of Melbourne, so um, Sarah Beckersey oh, and yeah. Georgia Garrard have been doing a lot of work on biodiversity sensitive urban design and have developed this framework for how to go about actually creating um, creating developments that um, respect and incorporate biodiversity into them from the outset. Um, and so I believe that they're, they're working um, on a couple of sites in Melbourne coming up soon speaking Hopefully to them in that on top february of, i think they wasn't supposed to be known following up um, from holly kirk they've been working on this concept of um biodiversity sensitive urban design for for quite a while and so they're now um, going to be doing some on-site um practical um work on it which is really exciting and so there's a really nice framework around how to go about creating great habitat for wildlife from the outset uh, if you're interested in what holly just just said um, both RMIT University in Melbourne and Melbourne University or University of Melbourne to give its correct name they both have people working on BUSD um, and we recently so it's not far down if you're on the live page you can scroll down and see when Holly and I spoke with Holly Kirk and that that discussion was loosely about this and um, we're just trying to tee up dates for the Melbourne Uni team to uh, to join us, and we think it'll be in uh, in February to continue talking about this. And we'll try and bring Daryl Jones back in because that's what so much of his work has been about. And we'll be reaching out to people in uh, in Europe where they've done a great job uh, with reconnecting fragmented habitat and we'll I'll try and find the right people in in the states as well um, because these are really important things and and this is you know what Holly and I talk about every every second week so 
Back to Holly. Um, of a, um, a subdivision going into place. So hopefully a really great, I think a really great um, um, series of case studies of, of how people, how developers um, can can create these great spaces, working with experts in that field, with with um, uh, like on the ground, um, and creating spaces that people want to be in, as well as um, as well as wildlife. So um, uh, Melbourne, um, let's be Melbourne centric here, is actually, um, they've, they've done another initiative, which I'll put a link in here for you. Um, so the city of Melbourne, um, realizing that the uh, plane trees aren't the most <laughs> yeah, exciting um, source of, uh, of food for uh, native yeah, there's uh, Georgia. mammals and birds and, and everything else and insects uh, because pretty much nothing eats them. Um, they've uh, started this initiative of uh, planting native mistletoes in uh, the plane trees throughout the city of uh, Melbourne. Uh, cool. And um, it's been really successful too. They yeah. know um, through my husband's work uh, that um, that mistletoes are a keystone species uh, in promoting diversity, uh, especially in insects. Uh, and then, and Maggie's husband. If if you aren't aware, is the um, fabulous Dr. Dave. And in the podcast archive and in the on the YouTube um, list, there's an interview I did with Dave about u using soundscapes as a, um, a, 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 as a tool, but replaying bioacoustic recordings of a healthy habitat to draw in wildlife back into a place that is being rehabilitated. And, and mistletoes are, a, are an essential part of that because mistletoes are a building block for insect species um, and things like lerps, which then bring... And mistletoes flower. Therefore, birds. Um, so they're they've they've started this trial um, to 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 high grade, I guess, diversity in the urban landscape. Um, you know, a, a, a shot of uh, of of goodness. <laughs> so go Melbourne! <laughs> Yay! Yeah, we're we're about to work with City of Melbourne on a, on a project too. Um, ah, great. Looking at how um, with RMIT and University of Melbourne, um, in looking at um, planting of corridors for birds in some of the key parks mm, in Melbourne, nice, and nice. by and banding um, banding fairy wrens and things, and looking at how they're moving or not moving across those parks, and using citizen scientists to report. The lovely. Sightings, the little banded birds, very, very lovely. Oh, lovely. Yes, yeah, in <laughs> Melbourne are doing some great things at the moment. Yeah, it's it's really good, and and actually they've got a really committed team. Mm -hmm. um, they do. Yeah, I was lucky enough to study with it, with some of the people in uh, Uni Melbourne, City of Melbourne, with their uh, in their uh, parks uh, groups. Maggie, you, you you mentioned about the missiles, hey, and. It's not that many years ago that I was working in parks and gardens and the very first things that we would cut out <laughs> of a tree when you, you know, is you get the arb crew out and take all the mistletoe out. Um, and just simply because I don't think anyone really was thinking to, you're thinking because we were all focused on the health of the tree and the risks mm. involved with an unhealthy tree. There's always so, that. So the best way to think about a mistletoe is um, if you've got a dog with fleas, are the fleas going to kill the dog? No, because they're just living there. If the dog dies, you don't blame the fleas. No. So if a tree has mistletoe, it's fine. But if a tree has too many mistletoes, 
you've got to go, well, what's wrong with the tree, the, the surrounding environment that's making it so susceptible to its version of the flea? Um, and just that train of thought, no, that, that yeah. didn't come about until quite recently. Yeah, no, it was always. I mean, you've got heat stress because you've got paving or roads and root systems under, under those, and, and maybe there's been new cabling go through for the internet and all those kind of things. But, of course, the problem is the mistletoe. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, 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 in a way, it's really positive that the eyes are now being opened about mm. all of these issues. But, of course, with trees and whatnot, they take street trees that are 80 years old, take 20 years to die. So a lot yeah. of the time you don't know that the damage has been done until... Mm. It's way too late to, to save them. So, um, well, <laughs> I think we've I think we've been ar around the block and back. Uh, <laughs> wow! Done a, couple, done, a of laps, done a couple of laps of the oval as well. Um, is there anything that you you think we may have missed out in our wine raging discussion? I'm going to put all these links. Wow! Up when did I you did you put that link in for the um, the Bird Life Australia? Um fact sheety thing yep and yeah. i've got the the, the awe.gov.au slash lay slash contact that one um, yeah so there's a there's a contact me thing and, yeah. and it opens up into a page and you can put your very sharply worded here's what you need to know about x yeah and then we've got uh holly's one for the um threatened species um biodiversity sensitive urban design mm -hmm. and that's yeah certain, that's great that that grassland uh, certainly looks like near near my place we've got a lot of the the remnant grasslands in melbourne mm. um and then you're under misunderstood magical mistletoes of australia i'm looking forward to reading that that's an abc link and then you got a youtube uh, one what's that one maggie um, I think that's the ABC um, uh, Gardening Australia did uh, a whole thing on it as well. Um. Okay. Now, um, uh, Holly, um, mm. I know I always put you on the spot. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna wrap it up there because uh, we just chat on to... for too long at the end of that now. So um, that's where I'm gonna wrap that up. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna ri r rack a couple of podcast uh, replays up so there'll be uh fran carlton who runs the wild talk podcast and um the uh the uh, uh forgive me the it, it's a counseling service for wildlife carers who suffer from unbelievable stress because so many of the animals that they care for don't make it. So Fran has like a like a helpline that carers can call for some help. And um, I'm going to play the uh, interview I did with Kirsty Costa, who had launched the Weekend Birder podcast. Um, and I've got one about feeding birds in, in the U S and especially for winter. Um, now that that's not about a podcast, but it is about a blog that's been going for like 10 years, which is really popular in, in the States. And I've also got another blogger who has a short podcast and approaches, he recently discovered, because of the pandemic, the lockdowns, the joys of bird watching, and he is also a rabbi. So his appreciation of birds comes from a very spiritual base. I mean, so different to uh, to mine, but we had a we had a really good um, a really good conversation. So I'll I'll set those up. Um, I'm going to have a break and give him a voice a rest. And what is it? It's 2.30 here in 
uh, in the afternoon in Melbourne, I'll probably rig it, rig the first one up for around five o'clock. So if you're on Twitch and you like the stream to go for ages, uh, I'm actually going to set the next one up so that it's got three or four um, episodes in it, and I will just I'll do a bit of a Hassanabi. Um, just let it run and come in and out and do some other things. But I've, it's it's hot here today, and as a result, I don't know if you noticed, my mic kept going on mute, and that's because the the hub where my mic is plugged in is getting so hot that it's failing, and that's what um, a lot of the problems we had with the earlier uh, stream with things not working is just it's too hot in my in my room here um for everything and um if i if i leave the door open for the for the aircon to reach me um then we're just all we're going to do is hear my housemate and whatever he's doing going on in the in the other part of the house so that's why we're not doing that um so thanks uh, let's see where who's who's still with us. Oh, hello Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube. We haven't had any any YouTube comments today. Um, make sure you're. Uh, oh, one of them is you, aren't, isn't it, Mon? Um, oh no, Mon, Mon's messaged me on on Twitter, um, but I don't think you're watching, are you, at the moment, Mon? I'm pretty sure I'm talking to Mon because she's not here. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, a couple of hours, just watch, uh, wait for the notifications or it'll be on the birdemergency.com slash live once I've set that up and um, yeah, you'll see. And I'll, and I'll rig up tomorrow's ones. So we've got, tomorrow we'll have the helmeted honey. Egg. So Maggie, Maggie mentioned, because it's a Klein, it's not even a subspecies, should we be preserving it? Well, I've I've just spoken to someone just a matter of a few months ago, who has been week working with the recovery team, and of course, the helmeted honey eater is the uh, the bird emblem of my state. Uh, so that's quite controversial, but yeah. So that's that's going to be fun, and I'll I'll set up the Monday with Holly that we did with Daryl Jones. And a lot of the discussion talked about that particular wildlife bridge. And, and we talk about other things like overpasses, what's happening in Canada and uh, rope ladders across freeways and all those kind of things. Rope bridges, beg your pardon. So there should be plenty to, um, to get into. Thanks for being with me again. If, if you're not following me, if you've moved over to Mastodon at Bird Emergency, at mastodon.social follow me there because i'm but i'm moving my things off twitter gradually and into into mastodon um if you haven't subscribed to the youtube channel please do that because i'm i have to build my follower base up to a certain level before i can do more things on on that platform uh I'm so tiny on Twitch. I don't think you can do anything on Twitch except watch and, you know, get involved. Um, oh, and and I'll just tell you too, I'm sure if you've been watching the whole way, you get the vibe. Um, I'm not going to be displaying comments that are just crap, right? It's just not going to get going. If you want to be constructive and be involved, love to have you here. But if you just want to... I mean, this isn't a Twitch gaming tra channel, right? And it's, um, uh, I'm not Hassan. So um, just take that on board. And uh, and I'm not very tolerant. If you're a dickhead, you get blocked. So um, my channel, my rules. So, okay. right. thanks everyone. I'll catch you in, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe t about two hours. What will that be? Two, maybe four o'clock, 4.30, something like that. Five o'clock, I don't know whenever I get it organized. See ya.